Hello, family. Um, and in this fellowship, I identify as a love anorexic, which means that in active addiction, I have a crippling fear, deep crippling fear of intimacy, deep crippling fear of commitment. Um, and it was ruining my life. Uh, what I will say is that I don't live that way anymore. I get a daily reprieve as a result of working these steps. Um, I have the closest relationships that I've ever had with my family, my friends, and my colleagues. So I really owe this fellowship, like, I was gonna say my life, and also with clarity, my, it saved my perception and of this experience, of this life experience. That's what I would say. Uh, I like saying international sex and love addict. That, I love, yes. Doesn't that sound cool? It might sound even cooler than just, you know, sex and love addict or, and I'm like, yeah, it's true though. I am an international sex and love addict. I was, I was I'm a sex and love addict here in New York. I was a sex and love addict when I traveled to Canada. I was a sex and love addict in Europe. I was a sex and love addict in the Caribbean. There is no place in this world I've gone that uh, I could escape from the tendencies that I have that really lead me to come into this fellowship. So, you know, now in recovery, I look at it with gratitude. It's kind of hilarious thinking of the ridiculous stuff that I used to do in the past and even the stuff I feel tempted to do in the present day. I just kind of laugh at myself. Um, so I just I'm asking God uh, to to direct my thinking um, as to what I share with you in this experience. My intention is always to be of service um, to the best of my human capacity to leave you with tools that you can actually utilize for your recovery because it's not about me and my cash and prizes and program. It's really about, for me, the enjoyment is to see other people living a, a bold, beautiful, joyful existence. Like that has been the thing that's lit me up the most from being in this fellowship and being in 12 step in general. It is the education that I did not receive in my childhood. It's the education that I did not get in, in school. My, my family of origin did not teach it to me. So I feel very privileged to have access to the steps, all 12 of them, to, to be a grown ass woman day in and day out. <laughs> um, also, I curse. So I don't apologize for who I am. I also say God a lot. I don't apologize for saying God. Um, whatever your highest power is, respectfully replace that in your head. Um, but I've learned through recovery that people pleasing is a defect. I'm here to be myself. And I am not the arbiter of anyone's recovery. How grateful I am to know I'm not responsible for anyone fucking recovering. I just have to talk about me. Ah, yes. Okay, so now to who I was, how I showed up in life. I was miserable. Um, I work program through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and there's a story. Um, if you have access to that book, it's also available free online. Uh, there's a story in the back of the book called Freedom from Bondage. That is a woman who really, like she closely associates romance and finance. And that story, when I read that story, I was like, I am a sex and love addict. I need help in this actually in, in multiple programs because I'm just a compulsive person. Um, I love men or I lust after men. I lust after money. I lust after status. And when I don't have those three things, I'll lust after other stuff like donuts and sugar. There's nothing I will not freaking use to try to make myself feel better. But I will say the most potent drug that I've encountered has been a man because they're the little validation machines that can say to me, I love you. You're so great. You're wonderful. You're sexy. You're beautiful. Donut can't say that to me. <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, wine and all that stuff, it doesn't it doesn't make me feel the way it doesn't tick my brain off the way that, you know, being in relationship with a, a another human that I am attracted to ticks me off. So uh, I feel like I was born this way. I was born an addict. Um, I talked to God about this and I was like, oh, OK, um, when I think about it, really, my recovery is ending shame, ending shame about feeling bad about who I am, ending shame about um, learning to tolerate it or coexist with that that experience of feeling like my feelings are wrong. Um, I'm a guilty, disgusting person for the way that I feel and the way that I go through life. Recovery is teaching me to to have a new voice, to, to replace my voice with God's voice in my head to tell me, okay, even though I feel a certain way about certain things, 
no, God, what do you say about me? So with regards to my childhood, I had a lot of shame. I had a lot of shame. Um, I've had several experiences in freedom from bondage. It says that I'm not the result of my childhood. I'm the result of the way that my brain responded to my childhood. So what my brain responded to in my childhood was childhood sexual molestation. I was incested um, early on in my life around the age of five, as early as I can remember. Um, my parents divorced um, and also my family was not a family that was really like emotionally astute. We didn't talk about feelings or how you doing, whatever. It was more so, hey, how are your grades? <laughs> How are you doing academically? Because, And I understand and I have compassion for my parents. Um, program is teaching me. They were my first sponsors. Um, and the sponsor can pass on what they've inherited. And my parents have, I've inherited a wealth of information from them. But spiritual intuitiveness um, or emotional intuitiveness, not so much, but I still love them regardless because they came to this country. I'm first generation Haitian American and they kicked ass. They made sure that I never wanted for food. They made sure that I always had a household. Um, and my parents couldn't know what was happening to me, you know, behind the scenes. So um, I love them and I accept who they are. But with that environment, my brain said, wow, someone sees me as a sexual object, as opposed to thinking this person has something wrong with them. I thought that you're some grand seductress. You, I don't even know how you can think about that at age five, but my brain goes, I'm responsible, somehow I'm sexy, and I need to dial it back so this person knows that I'm not, you know, available. And it came, it became a power trip actually too. I am so whatever, I am so, it became like a pride thing. I am so attractive, I have to beat the men back with a stick. They, they have no choice but to fall in love with me. Living this world in my brain. Lifetime movies also didn't help, all right? <laughs> Um, my dream guy would be like a guy that no matter how many times I told them go away, that they would just be there because I had a fear of abandonment. Um, so those stalker films and stuff, I'd be like, why doesn't she like him? He's good looking. What's up with her? Or, you know, in the movies where there's people really showcasing some really unhealthy interpersonal relating behaviors. I was attracted to that. I was attracted to the drama of a film and I wanted to like live it out in my life. But I was too scared to engage with men the majority of my life. Um, my teens and stuff, I didn't date. I just oogled guys, you know. It, would, it got in my way even in my teenage years. I remember in chorus, I would stare at the guy across the room, write my name down with his last name, not singing a lick. I would be lip singing, lip singing and just staring at him and just imagining him. I go home, think about him, think about him until the next one came. And I was like, oh, new one, let me think about that one. It, it, you could kind of get away with it at age 13. 22, not so cute. Now, 32, not fucking cute at all. <laughs> um, and yeah, I that whole like pride thing that I took in attempting to be like attractive. Um, my childhood enabled me to have defects of character that actually served me. So my distrust of people led me to watch people like a hawk, you know? And watching people like a hawk allowed me to avoid danger, but it also allowed me to know, to be intuitive. In recovery, it also teaches me to be intuitive. Does someone need something? Can I ask them a question? Something's going on with them. You wanna to talk to me about it? I would do that with men and they would feel intimacy with me, but I would never reciprocate. So I'd never feel close to them. I was scared to feel close. Even with my dad, who did not incest me, the other day he, he came and touched my shoulder and I got a scar on my face. Um, I went to the sauna, all the shit that I do to feel better, you know? <laughs> Nothing works but God, okay? But the sauna's great. I went to the sauna, got hit in the face and I got some stitches, they got removed. My dad was touching my face and my addict said, this is wrong, he actually shouldn't touch me. My own father. That's what my addiction does. It will keep me away from anyone and everyone, even the people that really truly love me. So now um, I think I mentioned enough about why I qualify for this program. I'm compulsive. Once I start getting into misery, um, shame, I can't stop it. It can't, it's like eating one potato chip. I just can't stop, I can't. Um, and it was ruining my life. 
This program is very important. People will talk about the substance programs, but my sex and love addiction, non-substance programs, um, they may not kill you literally, but they'll make you wanna kill yourself. That's my past. And essentially I came into program, um, another fellowship. I was more concerned about looking good and having status than I was about healing my sexual relationship life. So I was in the money fellowships cause I went through a breakup and I said, fuck him. I'm gonna get some money. I'm gonna have a car, I'm gonna have career success and he's gonna see me everywhere and he's gonna know that he's a loser and I'm a winner. That was my, <laughs> I was like, I don't ever wanna be the ex that they go, wow, I dodged a bullet. I'm like, let my glow up commence, right? But um, there's so much that I can shift in the outer world that if my internal world doesn't shift, I'm still gonna be miserable. So I can go to all the saunas that I can. I can work out as much as I can. I can um, learn several languages. I can travel the world. I can look great on Instagram. I can have all these things. I, I would say uh, God has blessed me with the Midas touch because everything that I've ever said that I wanted in life, I've received even down to the kind of man that I want. I was like, God, I want a tall, dark, and handsome. I had a picture of a guy that in high school that I was just obsessed over and, and salivated over. And one of my friends met my last partner and was like, he looks like that photo that you had in high school. I was you're right, he does. But guess what? My addiction is such that, um, you know, I always want stuff and I get what I want, but then I don't want it when I get it. So my addiction is, is chronic discontent. Um, I want a far away solution. Uh, don't tell me that you can actually help me or that I actually have to do any work. Tell me it's a lot of work. Tell me I have to pay a lot of money. Tell me it's going to take years. And I'll be like, yeah, let me explore that. So I don't actually have to get around to doing it because I really don't have the stamina to get into it and, and really like do the work. Um, so anyway, in the finance program, my sponsor was tired of me complaining about my relationship. Every financial decision I was thinking about, I was like, I think I need to ask my ex. I think I need to ask my ex for permission. She's like, child, you need to go in another fellowship. I was like, thank you. I went into to this, these meetings, turned my camera off, changed my name. Didn't want anybody to know me. I was like, let me get this recovery. Let me get the fuck out of here. I don't want to make no friends. I don't want to know anybody. I'm going to still be the superstar that I am. Give me my recovery. Let me get out of here. Thank you. Let's graduate. And God blessed me with a sponsor. Um, my sponsor, she was like, hey, she she plucked me out of a meeting, my second meeting. Hey, you want to work program? I was like, yeah. She's like, it doesn't have to take you that long. Do you want to meet with me like twice a week or three times a week? I was like, yeah, I'm desperate. My birthday's coming up. This could be a gift for me. Let me graduate and then I don't have to be here anymore. And um, we went through the steps, through the big book. Um, I was introduced to a group. They saved my life. I was, I was miserable. I was miserable. And I encountered all of these women who were alit and on fire, um, men and women actually, and non-binaries. I'm learning about all the labels <laughs> that were like, oh, like I, I actually enjoy my life. I had all these bad experiences, but my life is still like really good. And I was like, wow, the first time I encountered them, um, I felt anger and I felt annoyed and I was really judgmental and I actually raised my hand in that meeting and I just said it aloud I was like I'm really like very um, distrustful of happy people and groups that are like happy together like what the fuck is wrong with y'all but um, my sponsor told me to come to these meetings so I'm gonna do that and what I learned through recovery is that I was just scared that I couldn't be that I was scared that that life was in unattainable um, but I will tell you it is with my sexual abuse history I'm a joyful, happy, free person through recovery. With my parents divorcing, I'm a joyful, happy, free um, person in recovery. With all the shit that I've done and the stupidity that I've engaged in and the number of hours that I spent um, rereading exes texts and rereading old emails that they sent and re-listening to voicemails. And, and even while I was dating them, I would do that because my addiction just wanted more, 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 more. I could never get enough. All that time that I spent doing that, in recovery, it serves a purpose for the other person that comes in and goes, wow, she did that just like me. So, um, yeah, I worked the program in four minutes. Thank you so much. I worked the program in, in I would say, a month and a half. It's been a, over, a little over a year now. And um, basically, the, the tenants of 12 step or the tenants of spiritual gangsters is early AA. Bill W's ass started sponsoring in like a week of sobriety. You don't have to wait your whole entire lifetime to start carrying the message. 
carrying the message is a strong anchor as to what keeps me out of addictive patterns, that and building my relationship with God. So through working the steps, um, the, the steps allow me to transmute my negative emotions. I'm not a changed person. Like I never feel anger and I never feel fear. I have distrust all the time. When when Alicia was like, let's turn on the, the thing. I'm like, fuck, you're gonna record me? Now I have to be careful what I say? No, I don't. I'm protected by my creator. My creator says, listen, I take delight in you. I love you, be yourself. Um, and whatever you share, even though I know after this, you're gonna say, oh, fuck, you forgot to share that. I know you're gonna say that, boo, but your voice is not as important as mine. And the way that I live in that relationship really, yeah, I, I owe to this, this, this step structure. So let's talk about the steps. Step one, I'm powerless. Uh, my life is fucked up. I haven't met anyone that come into fellowship talking about, I just need relationship tips. My life is great. I just wanna learn how to treat my lover better. No, your life is on fire, You're fucked up. There's no hierarchy in this program. In any of these 12 step programs, the highest level you can reach is addict. <laughs> There's no hierarchy. Um, and step two, I'm not in control. Guess what? Can I believe that something else is? Yes. Some sort of divine creative force that I refer to as God that designed me in such a way that I don't have to tell my, my heart to beat consciously a million times a day. How does that work? I have time to worry. Worry is a luxury. And then step three, I make the decision that's yes or no, like my creator. My creator wakes me up. My creator, I have to say that day, I make the decision to turn my will, my stinking thinking, and my life, my actions, God, over to your loving care. And then I say the third step prayer. Fourth step prayer, we won't have time to get into it today, but you know, y'all can hit me up. I'm gonna put my info in the chat. Um, feel free to join our community. Any resources I have, we are abundant. Like this fellowship. It's fucking abundant and I, I it's a privilege to give away like whatever all the stuff that I've received, but the fourth step has changed my life it's one of my favorite steps. Um, fourth step has allowed me to deal with social injustice over this past year fourth step has allowed me to deal with. Um, social injustice racial injustice economic injustice all the shit we're going through COVID transmute that negative whatever that my brain thinks into something positive that God can give me spiritual principles to live out a life where I can be helpful. Fourth step changes from me thinking everybody's the problem to I'm going to give you a solution and you can be helpful. Um, and I'll tell you even right now, my country, my parents' home country is experiencing some, some social unrest. Um, I'm first generation Haitian American. Our president was assassinated recently. And I was just depressed. I was like, what the fuck? Like, what is going on? I was filled with anger. And I did a fourth step on it. And God was like, guess what? Even though you're not physically there, I give you, I'll give you the opportunity to turn this around. You don't have to be helpless. helpless. God gifted me with a sponsee that lives right in my parents' home country. And through gifting her recovery, we're currently working on translating the big book workbook that I work out of in, in the spiritual gangsters community into French. So it can be, so um, people can be sponsored in that country and then also translated into Creole, which would be a little bit harder so that it can be in that country. I'm not sitting around going, oh, woe is me. Life is happening to me. Work, the work really fucking works. Six and seven, um, well, five, tell my sponsor, tell somebody who works program like me, who's gonna point me back to God or point me back to solution in my steps. Six and seven, it's not my problem, it's God's problem. My defects are not my responsibility to get rid of. I just have to ask God to get rid of it. Eight and nine, weakest part of my program. I hate apologizing, but I feel so much better after I apologize. I've learned to apologize to sponsees. I fuck up all the time. I'm I'm imperfect sponsor, but they forgive me when I when I do what I do, you know? And then 10 is brushing your teeth every day. You see what you're doing, you know, that's jacked up. And then when I need a deep cleaning, I go back to my fourth step. 11 is conscious contact with, which is basically a trick because you're already engaging in conscious contact if you're doing steps one through, through 10. And then 12 is carrying the message, the most potent thing for me. Carrying the message has changed my life. I look at everyone like a sponsor or a sponsee. There's no difference between my outer world and my fellowship world. Um, I mean, they're looking at someone, how can I be helpful to this person? Or, hey, this person doesn't want what I have, leave them alone. <laughs> leave them alone. And it's sometimes in the same person. Uh, codependency, doesn't matter what the fuck I got. I got all of the shit. 
codependency, love me some wine when my, when when a man doesn't want me, love to obsess, even about fellows. Nobody likes to talk about that. We're an attractive bunch. And as we get recovery, we look and we see, oh, look at you in your square looking all cute. You know, <laughs> we got to use our tools that has to, I have to save myself from myself, me, God and, and the fellowship. Uh, my, my grand sponsor will kick my ass and go live in reality. You don't know this person. You don't know him. You already imagined being married to him. And I go, thank you. Thank you for saving me from myself. So we can't do this stuff alone. And shame does not thrive when you allow it to be public. You'll, you'll find that as you share your deepest, darkest things, I'm afraid I can't sustain a relationship. I'm afraid that um, I fucked up my career opportunities through my active addiction and, and God won't give me another opportunity. I'm, I'm ashamed that um, of how little it takes to throw me off of my emotional stability. I'm ashamed sometimes of, of the, the fact that I don't wanna go to God. And guess what? God says to me, it's all good. I'm gonna take care of you. Fellowship says to me, it's all good. We're, we're here for you. Um, me by myself, I addict, we recover together. We recover in, in community. So whatever it is you need, I'll put my info in the chat. Um, also, we keep like a whole list of sponsors. Sponsorship is life. I've learned so much about myself and so much about interpersonal relating um, through sponsorship. And uh, God, what would you say? We're about finished, but one more sentence. <laughs> we are about finished because we're working on this together, okay? Me and God. Um, the one thing I'll say is a real blessing is in my childhood molestation experience, I see how it's an asset in program. It's also been an asset in my family. Through the fourth step and, and, and fourth stepping sexual abuse, um, God has enabled me to talk to the youngins in my family and say, this happened to your auntie, this happened to your cousin, this happened with a close member of the family. If this ever happens to you, come to someone who's safe in the family that you feel comfortable with, and we will never judge you. We will take care of you. Come and speak to us. I would have never been that way in my self-centered disease. I only thought about myself and what could help me and what could protect me. Um, I live a life now of service, service to God and service to my fellows. And it's blessed my entire existence. So with that, I just say thank you. Thank you all for my recovery. I love every single one of you, even if I've never spoken with you before. I truly love you deep and I'm rooting for you. And with that, I pass.